Hello, today we're going to talk about reactivity 3.4.9 and 3.4.10. Um, this is a higher level only section and it gets into more detail about nucleophilic substitution reactions. So let's review really quick what a nucleophilic substitution reaction is. Um, a nucleophile is going to have some extra electrons that it can donate to form a coordinate covalent bond. The carbon that it's going to react with typically has a halogen on it. And the reason for that is because halogens are good leaving groups. And it creates this polar bond where the carbon winds up slightly positive because the halogen is slightly negative. And because of this slight positive, the negative charge from the nucleophile can um, attack the positive charge or is attracted to the positive charge on the carbon. And then the electrons in the bond to the halogen are broken. So you wind up with the nucleophile attached to the carbon and the halogen on its own now, separate. So that's why we call it a substitution because the nucleophile takes the place of the halogen in the compound. Okay, so let's start out with primary halogenoalkanes. They react via a SN2 mechanism. SN2 stands for substitution, nucleophilic, bimolecular. Now, if you remember back to kinetics, bimolecular means that two separate molecules have to collide with each other in order for it to react. So let's start out with a very simple primary halogenoalkane. So let's say I have ethane with a chlorine. Like this. And I'm going to draw it using um, our wedge and dash notation to show the stereochemistry of this compound. Um, the generic structure would be CH3, CH2Cl, but this is showing that um, tetrahedral structure around that carbon that's attached to the chlorine. And that carbon is our slightly positive carbon. Now what can happen with our nucleophile then can come in with those extra electrons, can um, get attracted to that positively charged carbon. And so those two things have to collide. So that's where that bimolecular comes in. When it does collide, it's going to form an unstable intermediate. And so it'll look like this. Let's use a dashed line. like that. So you'll see that in between, both the hydroxide and the chloride ions are interacting with that slightly positive carbon. And so this is our unstable transition state. From there, the electrons are going to transfer to the chlorine um, so that the chlorine can leave. And you're going to be left with the hydroxide attached to the carbon. Like this. And the chlorine will be by itself, chloride. Um, so the big thing I want you to notice here is that it flips. It flips its stereochemistry. So you'll notice that in the plane is on this side of the compound to begin with and in the plane is on the other side of the compound at the end. If you need to, please go back and review that wedge dash notation with um, stereochemistry. All right, so it flips. Um, so that only happens with SN2 mechanisms, and you'll see that flipped stereochemistry. Um, and you should also have an idea that this first step is our slow step, and the second step happens very fast because the, the chlorine leaves quickly. Um, the carbon doesn't like having five things around it. Um, so that first step where they initially collide, that is our slow rate determining step. Okay, so now the tertiary halogenoalkanes react via an SN1 mechanism. And so SN1 is substitution nucleophilic unimolecular.
So only one molecule needs to react at the very beginning. You don't have to have a collision for it to, for it to work. Now, let's do an example of this. Let's start out with our tertiary halogen of alkane. The carbon has to have three other carbons on it for it to be a tertiary halogen alkane. This carbon is still slightly positive. This chlorine gives us slightly negative, like this. So what happens is that the chlorine is going to leave first. It does that all on its own because it's unimolecular. It's just going to happen. All right. There are things that can help make it happen, but it's going to leave. And you will be left with an intermediate this time. Where this carbon is positively charged and the chloride now is all off on its own separate. This is our carbocation intermediate. From there, that carbocation intermediate can react, and it will react, because it is somewhat unstable. And it's going to react then with your nucleophile, which is very often hydroxide. And that is attracted there, and it's going to form your new alcohol. And it will be a tertiary alcohol. So our first step here is the slow step, and our second step is the fast step. But notice that you'll actually have an intermediate between the two steps which is different from our prior one, our SN2. SN2 only has a transition state in between. Um, so those are the two. Now, you don't see that inversion of stereochemistry like you did with SN2. The stereochemistry stays the same. There's no flipping around. That's because it, these carbons that are on the outside here um, cause what we call steric hindrance. They're too bulky. They block it from doing that flippy thing. Um, so that's why tertiary halogen alkenes only react via this SN1 two-step reaction. Now, secondary halogen alkenes are going to do a mix of SN1 and SN2. Remember, SN1 is for unimolecular. It happens in two steps with a carbocation intermediate. SN2 is bimolecular. It happens in just one step, um, but it has an unstable transition state. If we were to draw the reaction profile diagrams for these, SN1 would look like this, whereas SN2 would look like this, where this is that unstable transition state and this part here is that carbocation intermediate. And um, the first step for SN1 is always your slow step. So secondary halogenoalkanes, it will be a mix of those two things happening. Okay, so now let's talk about rates, rate of reaction. The first thing let's go over is our rate expressions, and we need to review this from kinetics. So if we have our SN2, mechanism, SN2. That's bimolecular, right? So your rate law will be rate equals K. Two things have to collide in our, um, in our reaction for this to happen, for it to be bimolecular. So the rate is dependent on both of those things, the concentrations of both of those things. So your halogenoalkane, whatever it is, you'll fill that in, and your concentration of the nucleophile because you need both of them to collide. For SN1, that is a two-step reaction. The first step is the rate determining step, so that's where we're going to write our rate law based off of. And our first step only involves the one molecule, the halogenoalkane, because it 
will lose the halogen all on its own. It doesn't have to collide with anything else for that to happen. So you'll see that SN2 bimolecular um, is going to have these um, two things, dependent on two things, so second order overall, and um, SN1 is going to be first order overall. Now the rate is also affected by the identity of the leaving group is going to influence the rate. Um, the fastest reactions are going to involve um, iodine, followed by bromine, then chlorine, then fluorine. And the reason for that is because the bond between carbon and the um, halogen um, the, has different bond enthalpies. And you can find those in section 12 of your data booklet. So the easier it is to break, the easier it is for that um, halogen to leave. So the specific identity of the halogen in your halogenoalkane is going to affect the speed of your reaction. Um, and so the, the easier it is for that bond to break, the better the leaving group it is, and the faster your reaction can happen. Okay, for this one, it says to identify an isomer of C48. C4H9Cl, which will react to the aqueous sodium hydroxide almost exclusively by SN1. SN1, you should immediately think, okay, it's got to be tertiary. If it says exclusively, if it's a mix of both, it could be secondary, but since it says exclusively, um, you want the tertiary halogenoalkane. So I know that our four carbons are going to be arranged like this. Uh, and then our hydrogens are going to fill in and our chlorine. And then the, um, because this is SN1, it's going to, the, car, the chlorine is going to leave first, leaving behind our carbocation. Um, and the chloride leaves, it's our leaving group. And then the hydroxide, because it's sodium hydroxide, the sodium is a spectator ion. So the hydroxide is able to come in and bond there. Make sure that your arrows are actually curly, curly arrows, um, and then form that new bond in our second step to form this new tertiary alcohol. And so those are your two steps. Okay, now this time we want to identify an isomer of C4H9Cl, which will react with aqueous sodium hydroxide by an SN2 mechanism. SN2 exclusively is going to be that primary. Remember, secondary could be either one or like a mix of the two. Now, um, I would like you to get in the habit of whenever you're doing SN2 mechanisms is to draw it so that you have the stereochemistry shown, the wedge and dash notation. So our C3 um, H7 and then our other two hydrogens like this. Okay, so this is um, our primary um, halogenoalkane here. It would be CH3, CH2, CH2, CH2Cl. And so this is the part that we're kind of zooming in on um, to show the stereochemistry. Now this happens in a single step. Um, but it forms an unstable transition state. So the um, hydroxide ion is going to come in. It's going to attack that central carbon there. And our transition state will form. I'm going to be consistent. Like this. Um, remember the wedge means it's coming out of the page and the dash means it's going behind the page. And then um, those electrons will head towards the um, chlorine so that way the, the chloride can leave and we are left with a alcohol that has an inverted stereochemistry from before. Um, and you still have the one hydrogen going forward and the one hydrogen going back. Uh, and the chloride separate. Okay, so this links to reactivity 2.2, energy profiles for SN1 and SN2. 
SN1, remember, happens in two steps. Um, the first step is where the halogen is going to leave, and then it will form your carbocation intermediate. Second step will be um, our faster step, where the um, hydroxide or the nucleophile is attaching. SN2 is going to happen in a single step, where the transition state, where the carbon has five things um, interacting with it, um, is at the top of that hump. And um, so you'll see the single step there. So you'll have um, SN1 is two steps, SN2 is one step. And I know it sounds backwards, but remember SN1 is for unimolecular. So one thing has to have the leaving group leave at first before it can do anything else. SN2, you, it's bimolecular. Two things are interacting at the same time, which is why it happens in a single step. And then you absolutely need to know the rate equations, again, linking back to 2.2. Unimolecular, so it's only going to be based off of the halogenoalkane, whatever it is. SN2 is bimolecular, so it is dependent on both the halogenoalkane and the nucleophile because they have to collide with each other in order for it to happen in that single step. Okay, so this question is interesting. How useful are mechanistic models such as SN1 and SN2? Well, it helps us to predict things such as speed, and it helps us to determine, um, like, like if we're trying to aim for a particular product, um, it helps to know the mechanism because maybe we need a particular optical isomer via an SN2 reaction, because that's the one where the stereochemistry is flipping. So if we know that I need like the L isomer or the D isomer, I can work backwards then using that SN2 information to figure out what um, activity of my halogenoalkane I need. Um, so having an idea of how these things work help us to um, create the products that we're looking for um, using the correct conditions. Now this also links to structure 3.1. Why is iodide a better leaving group than chloride? Um, so iodide forms a weaker bond with carbon, and that's because the iodide has more energy levels. So the attractions between iodide's nucleus and um, the carbon electrons and vice versa is a weaker, weaker coulombic attractions there um, because they're further distance away. So it's easier for it to break. It takes less energy to break. Chloride has um, less energy levels. So its nucleus is closer to the electrons of carbon and vice versa. The closer distance means that it has stronger coulombic attractions. Um, so it will require more energy to break, making it a, a worse leaving group.